Okay. Um, hello everyone, we're going to start right now because we have only 40 minutes and we have five people that are supposed to be talking. And then uh, we'd like you to please also talk with us so we'll have a dialogue and we'll know more uh, who we are and what we'd like to do together. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming today uh, to this session. Um, this one uh, is called uh, Cerebral Hemispheres of Scholarly Communication. So if you don't know it and you're not, you're not supposed to be here, go somewhere else. <laughs> but um, uh, the reason, uh, so my name is Boaz Nadal Manes and I work at, uh, at Brown University Library. I do tech services and the collections uh, money or maintenance. Uh, we meet with vendors uh, every week, every few days sometimes uh, more than you know we can bear uh, but uh, what we'd like to kind of focus today about is that the way that uh, things are uh, in transition uh, changing uh, not only in libraries where you know we have uh, folks that didn't do administration before uh, more uh, workflow managers type uh, IT types uh, kind of coming to become administrators. I guess I'm a good example because I'm doing workflows and tech services and now I do collections as well. I used to do some collection uh, uh, budget at Cornell as a philosophy selector. Uh, but at the same time that we're changing uh, uh, in libraries, obviously our uh, publishers also change. Uh, we have now folks that are uh, doing different things than what they used to do because we need different things. So uh, this discussion today uh, rose from a meeting that we had uh, just a couple of months ago, I think, uh, between uh, Emily uh, uh, from the Groder uh, and uh, the folks at Brown. And we were thinking, well, what's going on? Because quite quickly enough, we started talking instead of sales, about some uh, collections and interests and research. Uh, and uh, that was interesting because I took out of it the kind of thing that maybe we should listen differently <laughs> to the sales uh, folks that are coming our way now. Uh, and the example that uh, Emily will be talking about uh, uh, we, we do have editorial board folks now that have become sales uh, people, uh, which is interesting. Uh, we do have uh, different uh, interactions between uh, sales people and faculty. Uh, libraries are uh, engaged with the faculty and we want to understand uh, how that uh, uh, interaction uh, works. But we do have uh, burning issues and concerns that we'd like to address together. Uh, so we have many questions that we can answer in many different ways. I think the most important thing that you know this panel will probably try and address is what do we do together? Uh, are there, is it the right time for partnerships uh, to kind of think together? Uh, and uh, we do already some things like that, so we'll talk about that, but also uh, if there are other ideas on how we can work more collaboratively, uh, then we'd love to hear from you. So uh, the first person that is going to talk today is Jesse Konicki from Cornell. Uh, and I'll leave it to you to um, uh, present yourself and then we'll go forward. All right? Hi, everybody. I'm Jesse Konicki from Cornell University. Uh, the Ithaca cost study of uh, publishing scholarly monographs 
um, at university presses coming in at, um, ranging from like 15,000 upwards of uh, 40,000, some outliers even considerably higher for getting those, that kind of first copy of that scholarly monograph uh, out the door. Um, and uh, those, most of those presses are having trouble uh, recovering those costs. And um, the presses still seem to have a, uh, a charge essentially to be attempting to recover those costs, unlike, say, the libraries who, um, I mean, we have, we have to express or show how we're creating value, we're giving value to the university, but we are spending millions of dollars on resources and things like that. Um, and we don't necessarily have that same cost of recovery. Uh, mentality. But we do both share a mission of um, <clears throat> believing that this, uh, this scholarly record, um, uh, whether, whether journal articles, data sets, whatever it is, but uh, in this case, scholarly monographs, have a place and we, we, this is information that we should be getting out, the library should have available, the world should have available, whatever it might be. So, um, so assuming presses and libraries share that, uh, that goal, um, how can we find ways to get to that $25,000 or nibble away at some of those costs, whatever it might be. Um, and uh, so how can publishers, libraries, and the universities better support each other to bring this about? So I wanted to put together a few ideas I've heard over the last year and a half, maybe. Um, uh, none of which are new, none of which kind of and come out of my head uh, until right now. They're coming out of my mouth again. But, um, but they aren't necessarily all been brought together in a single discussion uh, that I've heard yet. Um, so we're on sources of funding. Uh, the idea of uh, a lot of presses are exploring open access as a model. Uh, that still requires us to find that $25,000 somehow. Um, but uh, whether it's through author's fees, that might be a little steep to get to get an author to pay that whole twenty-five thousand um, dollars. But some part of it, maybe um, support from the library uh, or other parts of the university um, to fund that. Uh, Knowledge Unlatched is essentially doing crowdsourcing to make some of these things open access. <clears throat> um, but uh, another area is. Uh, is funding, either full funding or partial funding from the university uh, or the institution. Um, in some cases, this is taking the form of the university forgiving that debt, essentially, that that press has, or, their, or the state attached to them, essentially. So, um, at least for now, allowing them to not break even. Um, and uh, how sustainable that is, we'll see. But uh, should you, is it important enough for a university that has a press to say it has a press? Like, is that part of the university's mission? If so, uh, perhaps that could be treated more essentially like the library. It's doing some services for the university, and uh, we determine there's X value to that, uh, to, uh, and that should, process should be fully funded by the university itself. Um, uh, we're mixtures of these things. So I just heard recently Amherst College Press uh, a, who starts the press these days? Um, Amherst College does, apparently. Um, they've got a combination of things. They've got had some open staff lines in the library that have gone to, uh, to work at the, their press they're building. Um, uh, they're using some of the endowments from their collection development uh, funds uh, to help fund uh, making a press. Um, they're canceling some subscriptions. They felt they could get away with uh, using some of that money to um, as collection development of having a press rather than um, paying a particular publisher. Um, those are all difficult choices, but uh, but it's different ways to get at that twenty-five thousand um, dollars. Some other possibilities are what are some different changes we can make to the model itself? Is a full monograph what was the answer in some of these cases? Um, some of, the, some of these smaller publications that might be cheaper to get out um, or work in some different way, whether it's in an open access world or not. Um, and then uh, finding savings. Uh, another thing, uh, libraries are spending, so in addition to that $25,000, libraries and publishers are charging each other money. 
uh, like there's there's a lot of work going into acquiring these things. There, there's some areas we can reduce some of that, whether it's open access or um, or any other model that gets us able to reduce some of those costs. If I have less people having to worry about acquiring all these things and paying all the bills to the different places, maybe some of them can focus on copy editing or some other work uh, for the press itself. Um, and then uh, finally, I think in the end, it's going to be some collaboration, whether it's the university and the press and the library or outside institutions, groups of universities coming together, uh, publishers, other vendors out in the world. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing things happen. I think there's a lot of experimentation going on right now. Um, grants can help fund some of that experimentation, but aren't likely to keep us kind of at a sustainable model. So um, let's see where we can take it. And uh, I want to pass it on to Glenn.
an atmosphere rich in experiential learning. Would this reduce some staff costs and the title-specific grant costs, the press level overhead, and then increase the in-kind contributions the press receives while also affording a richer educational experience for students, for new scholars, and enhancing the partnerships for faculty? Would this help new scholars be more successful because of their awareness of publishing? Let's continue to explore these questions and new possibilities and create new maps and new blueprints to guide us so that eventually these ideas will lift the hats off our cerebral cortexes. Thank you. Those networks, they go to professional and scholarly meetings around the world. Um, 
Brand is still, and I've heard this come up in many of the sessions this morning, brand and imprimatur is still very, very important. There are strong influencers uh, on author decision making about where they would like to publish, uh, where they can get published. Obviously, I think every uh, faculty member is solid moving through the ranks on tenure track would love to come up published by Princeton or Harvard. That doesn't always happen, um, but that's, that's aspirational. Um, and that does, those are the contributors do count. Um, and of course, uh, many university presses over time are specialized. Uh, Princeton is very well known in economics. MIT, for instance, uh, unusually in cognitive uh, brain science and in computer science. And just wanted to remind you too that UPs do compete with commercial publishers. Um, and the smaller UPs, though, will compete among themselves. So it tends to be internet Um And finally, the uh, librarians, what's interesting for us is that you know, the librarians understand the institutional cohort. Um, that's very clear to me. The librarians are on the ground every day. Acquisition editors, not so much. Um, they are fleet of foot. Um, again, they do tend to travel a lot. Um, they spend a lot of time, of course, working with their very specific networks. Um, there is an opportunity here, I think, and I saw this in an earlier session, which I think is very important. Um, you set the scene uh, talking about very innovative projects at UConn, UIUC, and Brown, where these libraries are working very closely with faculty to help um, guide them uh, toward uh, publishing opportunities that would be maybe not traditional and maybe traditional. In other words, your, this project would be best handled by a particular university press and here are the university presses that um, we think would be a good fit for your project. Um, you know, acquisitions editors, again, um, can work with um, and can cultivate uh, relationships with subject specialists and bibliographers. I think that's very important. Um, the subject specialists can discern trends. Um, and they see those emerging within the academy uh, often before the acquisition center complaint. And you know, again, um, the issue that we're struggling with right now, I think, is because sales on non of course, have been high, I would say. It's been very powerless in the last 20 years or so. We used to be able to count on 40% of our publications going to universities, libraries, now it's less than 20%. Um, there's a supply versus demand issue. Um, and more often than not, um, we think about supply side products, products and services, but that doesn't necessarily create its own demand. So this is where open access may come into play later on. We'll see if looking the book and being able to fund um, monographs, particularly, as Jesse talked about, um, given the high numbers, uh, won't have any impact in the state. Thanks for everyone so far. I'm uh, Emily Farrell from the Greater. I work as a sales manager. And uh, I'm going to try and draw a few things together and weave a little bit in from the uh, commercial press side. Um, so we've, we've heard a little bit about the different sorts of relationships that we see. How can a, uh, a library support university presses in being able to continue to publish low use monographs that are still very important for scholarship? Um, so some of the things that Jesse was talking about as well as Galadriel. Um, but also this, these important relationships of, uh, of editors in a press to the faculty that they work with over a long period of time. Um, so there are certainly all sorts of uh, deep relationships that have happened, but also a lot of gaps <coughs> where communication is still, there isn't a lot of communication between parties, and I think that there's much to be done um, um, so if I think about it from what I see within De Groyta and how we communicate, it tends to be that, yes, we have editorial and sales departments within the publisher um, and in the university, you yeah, have faculty and library on the other side, um, but the relationships tend to be quite close between our editorial and the faculty they work with for, for lengthy periods of time. and. There's not so much a relationship between our editors and libraries and librarians, um, whereas being on the sales side, we are talking to librarians all the time. 
Um, so is there a way that we can perhaps bridge gaps in a beneficial way? Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about a few things that we've done at the Grotto or a few that we're trying to, the projects that we're trying to work on to see how we might be able to improve these sorts of relationships and communication. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, in the last four years, we've started working with doing e-distribution for a small number of university presses. Um, so similar to the news, we also work with, um, we work with Harvard and Princeton, um, and uh, about, we have about seven university presses we work with. Um, but beyond that, in having just a small collection of university presses, one of the things that we're starting to try to work on is looking at, well, how does our editorial content fit with that university press's content, and how can we perhaps use our content to, um, to build a program together and to support each other, so to support um, the sort of low-use monographs that the university press is publishing by also drawing, drawing our content together. Um, another thing that we've worked on in the last two years is a small pilot project um, trying to find a solution for the fact that um, one of the big concerns of university presses is um, undermining print sales from electronic distribution. And so in general, um, it's, uh, there's been a lot of uh, conservatism in, in allowing books that might possibly be adopted for, uh, for courses um, not providing the, the digital uh, copies of books um, that, that may be sort of important revenue streams for the university presses. So how, what sorts of models can we come up with to make sure that libraries do actually get access to that electronic content, which is very, very des desirable, but is also what keeps university presses afloat. Um, so we're in the middle of a pilot project where we're trying to work out um, if we can actually um, manage, manage to do that, find a way for university presses to come together with libraries to support this, these sorts of models. Um, another thing that we've been trying to do is bridge the gap between libraries and the expert editorial knowledge that we have in-house. Um, so for instance, if we're doing presentations or webinars, rather than just having sales reps talking to librarians about uh, incredibly specialized content, um, I might be able to talk about linguistics, having spent time as a linguistics acquisitions editor, but I'm not sure my presentation of uh, Nietzsche database is going to be quite as good as, as our director of, of, uh, of uh, philosophy. So trying to bring this information together, it sort of sounds like a simple step, but it hasn't really been happening very much. Um, we also do, on the editorial side, do quite a lot of reporting directly to our editorial boards from uh, editorial side. So for instance, an older example, but uh, for our journal Semiotica, we'll, we, our editors give the editorial board of the, the journal an annual report. I think it's reasonably standard with publishers. Um, you know, so you get a general overview of the publisher, what's been happening. Um, the editorial board will get some journal statistics, some download statistics, um, the subscribers to the e-talk alerts and things like that. And um, and so moving from, okay, so these are some of the ways we're trying to make connections and how are we still sort of misfiring? What, what are, where are the gaps? And one of those is that, further down on this list, those editorial reports, I would imagine they could actually be quite useful for libraries and I don't know whether you can see that information. Um, so making that gap, uh, bridging the gap between the information that our editorial boards, who may be your faculty, um, the information they hold, seeing whether there's a way that maybe if that could be beneficial to, to the library. Um, also, in, in sort of curating these lists with university presses and working together on specific topics, is there useful feedback we could get from the library? Um, I often get information back from libraries that is incredibly valuable about how how you see the new database we have, how you're interacting with our e-books, um, but it's really important for me then to, to pass over to our editorial side because because they don't have the direct connection to libraries. Um, there's still, of course, with university presses as well, the concern about undermining print, and even with the models that we've been working on, there are still gaps in, in 
access to digital um, front list copies of the books. Um, and yeah, finally, just further connections that could be made between editorial knowledge and um, and libraries. So back to, to some of the points that Terry made, sort of re bridging that connection to faculty and to these deep, net, deep net networks within the mains that our acquisitions editors have. Um, a lot, the majority of the acquisitions editors at Dakota actually do have PhDs in the field they acquire in. So they, they're very experienced, they, and they love, they love the field, they know about it, they have great connections with the faculty. How can we piece sales and libraries into that picture for all of our, so of our mutual benefit. Um, and also, I you know, went to a, an interesting paper earlier on a user experience study where you know, University Library of Opera has, has come together with Taylor and Francis to look at, uh, at user experience of digital product. Great ways to start thinking about how we can actually draw all the information that we have together and start these sorts of experiments to undertake these sorts of studies for, for mutual benefit. That's, that's it. So now it's really questions. Where where do we go from now? Um, I'll pass it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let's open it up. We've got 10 minutes. Anyone wants to say something or uh, ask us or just float an idea? If no, then we can ask ourselves questions instead of what you'd like. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm just taking it on, and if somebody stands there, I'm going to know. So if you'd like to ask a question, please just stand up. Uh, so do we have, uh, in, in my opinion, there is also a data uh, element that, you know, like I'm really curious about, and besides, you know, knowing more about uh, you know, the way that the editorial kind of reports uh, to the, uh, you know, back to the uh, administration or the, the heads of the publishing house, uh, what sort of information uh, is shared and what, uh, so we heard from Terry, uh, you know, numbers around sales. Uh, and I'm curious for a long time, can libraries actually use that information proactively to begin to support uh, declining uh, uh, areas of publishing? And is in, and what is it that we need to know in order to invest uh, money in uh, areas that we think are important? Uh, so, uh, is there so so what to do about that? Like let's say you know once a year we get like a decline in the sales of you know the German philosophy uh, book on you know Nietzsche, right? Uh, which I don't think suffers uh, much because usually Nietzsche is uh, quite popular. But uh, but let's say so so uh, what what do people think? Is there is there something we can do about uh, things like that or? I'll give it a go. Um, to be honest, my first image when you when you ask that question is is unfortunately a bit of a sort of a, a, a chasing a tail. Um, in that um, often, certainly on the, the editorial side, you're 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 always looking at what's next. You've got you can't have conferences all the time, as Terry said, international conferences. You're looking at what the new topics are. You're seeing where the directions in research are going, um, and uh, you know, looking at patterns, always analyzing and trying to follow those patterns and apply in those directions. Um, I think the way that links to what you said is that if that doesn't necessarily link back to areas of specialty at your university or areas that might not be some sexy topics. Um, then those would be the areas where there might need a bit more to undergirding to, to allow for that sort of publishing to go on. Because I mean, we're, we're talking about very narrow scholarship. We're, we're talking about books that 200 people, maybe we sell 200 copies. Um, so these are, are books that with increasing um, you know, financial pressures, not just on university presses, but also smaller commercial presses, um, I think we, we do need to be careful to make sure that they continue to be very viable in the way that they are now. Um, 
the question of how to do that is yeah, um, I agree with, with Emily. There is market failure here, um, and, and it's, that's not going to remediate anytime soon. Um, we are, uh, at the end of the day, even on the nonprofit side, we are businesses, we are PL driven profit and loss. Um, we can't support um, very, very narrow scholarship, particularly on the book side. Um, in my early days in acquisitions, we could count on selling 1,500 copies of the typical humanities line graph. 1,500 copies. We cleared our costs after three years, and the rest was surplus. Now, as Emily said, we're talking about 200 copies. Um, I was talking to a press director about a year ago, and he said, we're finally down to 100 copies um, for a typical humanities line graph. You can't, they can't do it. They, they can't publish that. So, Unless open access, um, there's a way to flip the book and we can get revenue coming from um, a completely different source uh, to support that kind of activity. I, I don't think that we're going to be able to push this forward in a way that would be sustainable for other libraries and publishers. Sorry, just to also one last point. The, the, just back to well, why does it matter that these books are still published? Um, I mean, on the faculty side, these are you know, first or second monographs that come from deep research that, that professors are doing that they absolutely have to be publishing with a reputable press, and you know, that's the idea of brand, um, to be able to even get a job, um, so, and, or to get promoted and to continue to get tenure. Um, so all these models are sort of precariously balanced on each other, whereby um, unless something changes with, with the ways that tenure is assessed, then these books will still need to be published and there needs to be a way to, to make that possible or to continue to publish them. I mean, I think in the grand scheme, it's stuff that all fits into, I mean, is, is that mission to, that this is a scholarship that should be getting out there into the world, is that mission still the one we want to meet? And, and uh, or, or have to, or uh, whichever it is, um, and what can we do to make that, make it work? Right. <laughs> so let's say the mission is the same, uh, and we still want to keep that mission afloat. Um, back to the data, okay? So, yeah, we understand that there is like, you know, a decline and we, we do show it on a passive, like on a, in the slide and at the end of the, you know, like analysis. But uh, have you thought of like a more, uh, so, so let's say there is like, you, you've seen a certain discipline and for us sometimes it passes into call number ranges or whatever. Uh, if you see that there is like the, this kind of steady decline in a certain uh, uh, topic, or uh, is that something that you think is dynamic enough that you can stop sharing uh, those with libraries in the same form that you know we kind of got used to get like a you know counter statistics and other things like that, or is that kind of private and we, we don't think we'd like to share it, uh, or, we, or the infrastructure is not there, which is quite often the case that uh, we, you know, uh, we chase the, the tool that will do things for us and it's not there yet, but maybe we should look into it. Reactions? We do operate in a competitive environment, so there there are certain data points and analytics that we we can we can share. Um, even within the university press community, so the level of transparency, um, which is very liberating for me um, when I work at Cornell um, in some libraries, is not quite there yet. I'm never sure it will be within the university press community. Um, certainly, there, there could be more interactions, and I would say that it probably, is, I don't want it to be retrospective, I want it to be prospective. In other words, what new content types can we cultivate? Um, where can we um, solve a problem of particular subdomains uh, and how to get that material published? Um, I mean, I, yeah, I would say the same. I think it's the, there is that difficulty of, sort of being on the commercial side and sharing that sort of uh, information to a degree, though, I mean, we, we do certainly, in the reporting with you, the editors, the editorial boards, we do include you know, some amount of sales numbers, which, 
themselves because it wouldn't be included in the data that the library would normally see. I think. So that's that might be a point where we can do it. There are also other other areas I think that could be pinpointed in terms of decline. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, and this is something that's quite uh, I guess clear for us as a German publisher. Um, that foreign language materials are uh, certainly, you know, usage is declining. Um, would there be a way there to look at some sort of experimental model for um, the German language content um, working together with the library? I suppose that would be my suggestion that possibly that could be an area to work on because it's clear that that is an area where there's a difficulty in trying to balance out usage and, and the kind of usage in collections. Um, I mean, the other thing is, too, the perspective of, uh, that we get is what we, what we see with authors and editors in the European market. So in Germany, in Austria, in Switzerland, there are a lot more initiatives where you can get funding to support to, uh, uh, printing costs. That, that's, and it's an, something that people have done for such a long time that it's very normal still. So if you're publishing a very narrow scholarly mon monograph, it's not at all that normal that you would just apply to the fund at your university for uh, production costs as a, a, a print subsidy, and that that was in place long before discussions of open access. Um, so, and it, maybe there, that's also a point to look at so the comparisons between the, the other markets. Thank you. Okay, uh, last um, kind of bit of questions. If anyone has anything, uh, come. And ask it because we ran out of time. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, uh, and uh, uh, see you soon in another session. Probably, bye.